Now we're back, we're live at three o'clock. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. We're going to talk about the virus today. We're going to have a report on the virus from uh, Rupmani Kandakar, uh, who actually has written a book about it. Um, and uh, I, I can't wait to look at that book. It's just coming out today. Welcome to the show, Rupmani. So nice to see your smiling face. Good afternoon, Jay, and uh, very nice. It's always a pleasure to meet you again. So let's talk about your book. Um, title of the book, we can see it there, Raging COVID-19 Pandemic, uh, The Wuhan Conspiracy. Oh, very provocative question mark. question mark. Can you talk about your book? Can you talk about the essence of your book? This book is like, like we all can see, the pandemic is still raging two years on uh, since we, we met it. So uh, this book is about going back to the roots and finding out whether the origin was zoonotic or was it lab. So it's, it's a comprehensive book. And unless, uh, maybe we may, we may never find the zero patient, but we can, these, this trail can lead us to an investigation about how we can prevent future pandemics. So it's kind of a little bit of a peek into the past, to find out if we can do anything to prevent something like this again happening in the future. So it, it's, it's, it's a nice book, I hope. I, I have to look at it, I really do. Because you know, we've all been thinking about it and it's, it's a book whose time has certainly come. We need to know more about this because this is defining the human race now. Uh, yes. you know, in the past, I, let me ask you this one biochemical question. Is this the first time that humanity has been faced with a virus like this? The SARS-1 uh, virus, which was um, before this, uh, it had a higher fatality rate than this virus, but uh, the destruction, this, the disruption, the death, and the distress that this virus has caused has made this virus more visible. SARS-1, SARS uh, the countries were just understanding what is a pandemic. We had an Ebola, but it was concentrated. Something like this, which came as a shock, we can compare it to directly the 1918 Spanish flu, which, which, which wiped off 50 million people. So it was in that time that um, the world was scared. And I think this is the second time that actually the world is thinking, Why, where can I go? What can I do? How can I stop this? So uh, that kind of uh, fear, like you said earlier, it's the fear that is conquering us. And now, instead of thinking that the virus is the enemy, now there are blame games starting. You're thinking this government did this, 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 uh, this uh, public figure is not doing it properly. This should have been done. This should not have been done. People forget it's a personal battle between you and the virus. It is not anybody else. The virus is going to affect you. But the blame games are on higher levels. It goes on the local, the district, the state, the national government. So these blame games are going to continue throughout. But nobody has to forget that the enemy is still and will remain the virus till we find a good vaccine for it. Well, uh, there's so many questions I want to ask you. We should take about six hours here. Um, what, 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 uh, so it, it, people say, it has been said for the past year, um, that this is ultimately going to settle down into a, a, an endemic where it'll be like the seasonal flu and we'll have um, you know decent um, vaccines and so forth. By the way, I just took my booster shot two hours ago. I'm feeling stronger already. Yeah, uh, <laughs> More power. <laughs> so, More power. that we'll all settle down into a sort of an endemic, and um, you know, and hopefully we can, you know, put a lid on it so it doesn't. It's not as threatening and scary as it has been. Do you do you feel that's going to happen, or is this the kind of thing like in the Spanish flu? It, it sort of goes away. Um, you know, it's like a mystery. It stops. It just stops of its own. Uh, and then, you know, decades later, we find some other kind of virus is happening. Is that the way it's going to be? Or is it just going to be, a, you know, a contained, constant level of new viruses that we will 
always have to cope with. Yeah, I, I hope so optimistically uh, that it, it finishes fast. But the immunity that we are thinking of, the vaccines have not been that effective to stop the virus. And the virus is such that within two days, it finishes you from a healthy person to a finished person. So, uh, so I mean, it is, it is scary. People want to believe that it will phase out which usually happens in viruses, if you do social distancing, if you contain yourself, you know, the quarantine measures are not that effective. People want to come out of the lockdown. People think that the virus, is the, the pandemic is not over if you think it's over. It has to be over in the world. So they have to follow rules. They have to follow personal rules. They have to follow social rules. They have to follow rules in the society, in the nation. You can't go for shopping and say, let's, 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 tomorrow the pandemic should finish. So it's not that. You have to have uh, complete faith in this uh, concept of social distancing, the mask, taking the vaccines which are available, and helping the governments. We well, have so do you agree with me? I don't know if you covered it in the book, but do you agree with me that this is a test of humankind? We have to collaborate. We have to work together. We we all have to follow some fundamental rules. And if we don't do that, there'll be you know hundreds of thousands, millions of deaths that didn't have to happen. I mean, such as what's happening in the American South right now. Um, and and so far, you know, in some ways we are collaborating. In other ways, we are failing to collaborate. Um, but in any event, it, we're involved in this kind of biblical test of an existential threat. What are your thoughts? It's true, true, Jay. Like, uh, we are so interconnected. We are so apart at the same time. You have to help each other uh, to come together. And you know, the crises are not stopping. Like you said, it's not stopping. One comes, the other goes. Now, if there's a crisis like we talk about, do people think about the pandemic? People forget about the pandemic in this time. But the pandemic is still continuing uh, its course. If you, if you have an event, we think, let's go for it. But you forget that there's a pandemic raging still. So you have to uh, understand that it has to be really about coming together about this. And um, global solidarity, like we saw, in any case, when India, last time we had this program, uh, when India was in a troublesome uh, position, we had oxygen cylinders, oxygen concentrators flown in from Qatar, Oman, Saudi Arabia, UK, uh, Austria, everybody came to help. It is, you know, your global obligation that makes you act together. So that help is, went a long way in bringing out India from this pandemic. Uh, is, is, India, this, is India okay now? Much better than last time we spoke about. Like the numbers, the active cases have come down to around 1.14% of the population. And around just 380 active, uh, like affected people right now, lowest since March 2020. Well, very interesting. So it's not, it's not a, a crisis at the same level that it was. No, that's, the that's infrastructure really has improved. The oxygen uh, supplies have increased to such an extent that there have been stocking up. You know, before the, before the pandemic hit, India was just producing around 4,000 tons of oxygen, including industrial oxygen. But the way the government has ramped up the oxygen uh, production has been phenomenal because we have um, uh, we had industries which came in and were asked to provide their infrastructure to produce oxygen for medical purposes. Mm. If we see in the WHO, the medical oxygen is given second priority. You know, a funny thing but, is, right? uh, just, just rolling my tapes back on the last year and a half, in this country, in the news, cable news, we hear about ventilators for extreme cases, for, you know, fatality type cases. Yes. Um, we don't hear that much about oxygen. Is, is oxygen in addition to the ventilators? Is it part of the ventilators? 
or is it separate? I recall um, some, you know, some graphics from, um, you know, the hard times in India a few months ago, where uh, people were just, you know, breathing off an oxygen tank. Um, yeah. uh, is oxygen something else that we should consider as a as a way to survive? Yeah, because it, it the virus when it hits your lungs and it infects your lungs, you find difficulty in breathing. So you need, there are beds, there are COVID beds where you are just quarantined. There are secondly, there are oxygen beds where you are just given a supply of oxygen where you are just breathing in pure air just to come out of it. And third is when you're unable to breathe and you need a ventilator to support your breathing. That is like a three-stage uh, uh, phase out of the treatment for the pandemic. So, so one of those uh, stages is just to take oxygen by itself without just necessarily yes. having a ventilator. Yes, yes. It need, you need oxygen to survive. And you see the overwhelming population of India. So when so many people were affected, we did not have enough oxygen to be supplied to these people. Mm. So oh, yeah. the health infrastructure showed a collapse. But when they started these uh, facilities in sports playgrounds, in race courses, in, um, in uh, uh, wedding halls, they started facilities to take care of these patients. We had wards built um, in, um, in these facilities, which segregated these patients. And now at today's date, currently in this month, India has, a, um, a, the central government has supplied 26,000 ventilators to the state governments to keep in case the third wave hits. So we have an excess uh, stock of uh, supplies to deal with the fact. The lessons have been learned very well by this government. Jay. So uh, what about ICU beds? Is India a surplus of ICU beds? We do have ICU beds, but these ventilator beds are known as ICU beds in, Same thing. Uh, for mm -hmm. the COVID. Yeah. Mm, okay. I want to go, I want to go back to uh, this this whole notion about cooperation and collaboration between you know groups that may not otherwise collaborate about things. We have in this country an almost unbelievable division, a political division, I think, of people who are quote and quote hesitant about taking the vaccine. And that is, we know from a scientific point of view, that's very dangerous. That's how you spread it. That's how you develop uh, you know, variants. So my question is, do, do you understand that from a psychological, sociological point of view, why people would take action that undermines their very ability to survive? Anti-vaxxers have always been a part of society, haven't they? They're, they're, they're pessimistic about the vaccines. And uh, if you take statistics in India, 58 million or 58 crores of uh, people have been vaccinated till date. And the government plans to vaccinate the entire population by 2024. That is the broad framework. Okay, now they are supplying vaccines free of cost to the state governments and the union territories to keep and to give as and when the population needs it. Okay, now the vaccination drives have been so intense but they cannot afford to miss these people who refuse to take the vaccines. They, they feel that it's not safe. If you see one person dying because of a side effect of a vaccine, you will say, I may not take it. I should not take it. My family should not take it. Um, let's not go through it. There's a fear that keeps on playing. Uh, it's, um, what do you say? Accentuated fear. When you see the side effects of the vaccine, if you feel if you've taken the vaccine and you feel a bit of pain, you say, oh, it is that side effect of the vaccine. You will tell your friend, he will say, hey, I will not take the vaccine. I'm fine. I'm, I'm pretty fine without it. So kind of, uh, why should I take it? So uh, the anti-vaxxers are a minority, but in this pandemic with such a large, uh, such a large heavy rate of transmissibility, we can't afford to miss these people. We need them to come and say, yes, let's vaccinate. Let's develop a herd immunity. And like you said, let's take it to progress to just being a flu, a seasonal flu. 
And yeah. once that happens, we are, we are back to normal life. Knock wood. So <clears throat> would you, Rupmati, would you create a vaccine mandate in a given jurisdiction and say you will take the vaccine unless you are excused by a medical you know, professional? You must take the vaccine. And if you don't take the vaccine, we're going to do bad things to you. Would you have a vaccine mandate? What about our fundamental rights, Jake? Uh, everybody has the right to say they cannot, they want, or they do not. You know, that comes in all the time. You can't say, you have to do this. My, what about my personal freedom? They will be, you know, rolling down tears by, uh, uh, if, if the gov but the government needs to do this. We need somebody to say, everybody has to take the vaccine. It is, it is a must if we want to stop this, because this is going to rage for two years. It can rage on for 12 years. So. Uh, if you want to come out of it, the anti-vaxxers, the psychological blockage that you have for not having this vaccine has to be left out. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's a thing that you do not only for yourself, you do it for your community, you do it for your nation, you do it for the world. So you can't have an anti-vaxxer sitting in a plane and then infected people who will go around the society and then spreading it again. Because you can, the, the danger in this is because this virus, you can catch it again multiple times. It's not that if you catch it once, it will stop. You can catch it multiple times, even if you have had the vaccine. So you have to be a, a tad bit more careful than you were in the previous pandemic. Now, what about the monoclonal antibodies that uh, Trump took uh, when he tested positive, when he had the disease, and uh, Greg Abbott in Texas, the the governor, he apparently took that too a day or two ago when he tested positive. Um, <clears throat> would you uh, endorse, um, you know, expanding that program to cover everybody who tests positive? These, these uh, innovative uh, treatments are, uh, uh, are, are so widespread. We had something like this in India known as the plasma therapy, where they were replacing your plasma. We had some, I heard something about a lung transplant being happening. Don't go into complicating things. Keep it simple. You have to keep life simple and this treatment for this virus very simple. <laughs> you can't come, and come with more complications. You know, you're giving the medical community uh, guinea pigs. Yes, absolutely. Right. You know, hopefully there'll be better vaccines going forward. I assume, you know, the stakes are high from a profit point of view. They'll be, they'll be looking into every possibility. But I want, to, I, want to, I want to go to another area that you and I talked briefly about before we started the show, and that is the economic side of things. <clears throat> you know, uh, we, we have had an acceleration in the infectious quality of the virus, and we've also had an acceleration in the fear about the virus through social media and other media. And, uh, you know, if anything happens, including uh, side effects in one out of, you know, millions of, ca millions of vaccine uh, cases, um, then, you know, people take that out of proportion and, and they get afraid. And so they become, you know, uh, hesitant. <clears throat> but the other side of the fear is people are afraid to have children. They are afraid to start businesses. They are afraid to go out, afraid to spend money to acquire things. They don't see a future. They think the future is very short term. A lot of people, and that's very rational as far as I'm concerned. <clears throat> so. So then you have a predictable um, reduction in the, in, in the gross national, gross domestic product um, mm -hmm. in a given country. And if you add all the countries up, you have a, a reduction, a, a visible and continuing reduction in the gross global product. Wow, mm -hmm. that is saying something. And I don't think that it's rack and pinion. What I mean is it doesn't happen today with the given number of new infections, it happens over time. And so you really can't get a handle on it right away. You have to sort of look back and see, hmm, how did things change in the economy? Just because we have more jobs right now, that may, be, that may not be a good metric. So I, I wanna know your thoughts about that. I wanna know your thoughts about how all of this and the fear affects the economy, hmm, not only today, but going forward not only in a given jurisdiction, but in, in a global analysis. 
See, uh, Jay, like you rightly said, it's the will to thrive, the, 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 the zest to strive for success has just imploded. People want to just cocoon themselves and say, now, why should I do this? And what will I get through this? And your long-term <coughs> stock options and your savings are not now 10 years and 20 years. Life agendas have been thrashed. And you think that now let's just think about next week and next month and I should have immediate medical care um, money available with me. And I should not think of uh, how I should get that promotion and how I should, uh, you know, that, that zest is reduced in nations as well. They're thinking now, instead of importing, exporting, they're thinking of how can I now do uh, domestic production? In India, something like this is known as Atma Nirbhan. Okay, so that means self-reliance within your country. You can't stay now, let's go for exports, imports, let's, let's make this country the, the biggest possible, um, uh, what is that, um, player in the international system. Let's just keep it to a lower level. And let's, like you said, it's just uh, going from one stage to a lower stage to a lower stage to a lower stage. They're not able to come out of it because more than psychological, it is like, what should I do this for? If the virus hits me tomorrow, what should I do? I, I'm helpless against the virus. So why should I go out and thrive? Or why, why should I go out and strive rather than thrive? So uh, that affects productivity to such an extent that um, you, know, you have to depend, you, you feel like depending on somebody else for your daily needs, you feel, okay, fine, I can get, uh, like the Indian program has fed around 80 million people for two years on rations. The government is providing them basic food. So if a person is getting this, he will think, let me survive this pandemic through this. I'm not going to go out for work. That brings down the productivity, that brings down the uh, domestic uh, indulgement of the labor force. So people have to come out of this and come out and work, put your, put your masks on and start work. Normal life has to resume. It's, it's such a blockage. There is a virus, there is a psychological blockage, there is, there is, a, uh, and there is a whole cloak of fear surrounding this. So it will require too much of internal strength to come out of it. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because last year and uh, Trump was part of this. He kept talking about a reopening even after the, vi the virus had not peaked and he was talking about a reopening. He, he hadn't taken any affirmative steps to stop it. Uh, and he was talking about a reopening and, and people, you know, they take the message of the leader and they, and they started reopening everything. Okay. And there was of sorts a reopening about, about a year ago. Um, mm. It was a false reopening, in my opinion, um, because, it, you know, it, it, it was the wrong time for it. So um, it, you could say that there were more jobs. You could say that the, uh, you know, domestic product was doing a little better because people were going back to work, at least for a time, trying to get on the reopening bandwagon. But then we've had, we've had serious surges since then. And now people are really um, questioning that... The, raising the questions you just mentioned more and more and more. And my own personal theory, I want to bounce it off you, is that people are not going to have the same level of reopening optimism that they did a year ago. Now they're going to really think twice before they rush back into a, a, a sort of an artificial norm, nor, normalcy. Do you agree? Yes, yes, yes. So correct, so correct. It's, it's true, isn't it, Jay? The government tells you lockdown and you close up. And then they say, open, it's open, lockdown over. And then you want to come out. And then again, they say, hey, 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 go back. You have New Zealand with one case of Delta virus closing down the country. I think everywhere else, every household has one Delta variant person safely sleeping on the bed somewhere. But uh, this kind of panic is not called for. You have to live with it. Jay, it's not going to go away. 
because we are living in such an interconnected world. When it starts from one goes to a billion, uh, eight billion, you have to understand that it's going to be part of your life. You catch it, you treat it. You catch it, you treat it. It's that. And you try to survive it. That will to survive has to be inculcated mentally rather than physically. And when you make it a part of life, like just brushing your teeth, it's okay. You have to just uh, make it uh, part of your life yeah. and say, okay, it's like you initially said, like a seasonal flu. Yeah. If I catch it, I catch it. Yeah. You may philosophical, yeah. kind of be philosophical, <laughs> build it into your worldview, you know, and that, mm -hmm. that is for everybody in the world. On the other hand, um, <clears throat> we have to see how that affects the economy because I think countries and economies are going to have to build it in too. Uh, they're going to have to find a way to evaluate their economy uh, or motivate their or manage their economy uh, with due regard for the fact that people are not going to be quite as uh, uh, vital, eager, you know, um, you know, eager to participate in the economy. Because you can you can tell me this, Rupmati, and I'll do it. I'll listen to you, but not everybody will. You know, some people are just going to be, to use the term, depressed. Like yes. depression, they're going to be yes. depressed. They're not going to go back. And so, you know, the, 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 the demographics are not perfect. And so we have to see how this all plays out. And really, ultimately, I think what you said will take place is just a question of time. So we have to look forward and we have to build that into the, the, the question of time. So yes. let, me, but let me ask you about your book now, because this is very interesting stuff about the conspiracy over the origin, uh, you know, zoonotic or maybe laboratory developed, uh, you know, virus. This is uh, scary. Um, and just, just as you've written your book, uh, Think Tech just finished a documentary about uh, the, the, um, the uh, uh, well, we call it um, the, the, the spiraling crisis, uh, the alarming convergence of climate change and, and pandemics, because we believe that there are, we and our scientists believe there are fundamental, you know, common denominators that create both. And one relates to the other. And if we didn't have such a problem uh, in climate change, we wouldn't have such a problem in, in pandemics, arguably. But my question is, and in that, you know, uh, examination that we made, of course, the issue came up about what happened uh, in Wuhan. So let me ask you, what happened in Wuhan? I wish we know fast because we, we need to get to this uh, zero patient. Who was the zero patient and why did the research is that? There are so many, you know, it's, it's fun to take it as a conspiracy theory, then just take it as a zoonotic origin because there are so many supporting uh, evidences to state that it is lab created. The genome sequences, the uh, scientists disappearing, the whistleblowers being crashed, and the creators being rewarded. Uh, if you if you want to find out, read about the Batwoman uh, of Wuhan. So uh, these things are more interesting in the sense, and uh, logistically speaking, China is not allowing the WHO to enter for a second time. The first visit was a chaperoned visit. It was in such high security. And um, the statement was so bleak, saying that it was just, we don't know what it is. And you know, you can't give such a statement. The whole world is suffering. We need some answers. These answers need to be concrete and they can't be uh, they can't be uh, absurd. They can't be like maybe it was and maybe it is in a, a bad cave and maybe it came in the fish market. It can't be like this. It has disrupted. Economies, it has disrupted businesses, it has destroyed lives, it has taken um, destroyed families. So uh, people need, uh, uh, they are accountable for answers. Just because aside aside is, from uh, accountability, Rupmati, another thing strikes me, and I wonder what your thought would be about it. <clears throat> let's, let's, I think it's fair to assume that the scientists in Wuhan, the Virology Institute of Wuhan, uh, we're working with this virus. I mean, it, it got out of that, um, yes. that that laboratory. It was in that laboratory 
before it got out. And they were working with it. <clears throat> um, and in working with it, they were learning at a, you know, at a microscopic level, uh, how, and, and at a DNA level, how, how, um, how it worked. What, what, is, what is this virus? How does this virus conduct itself? Um, <clears throat> what, what are its mechanisms? Uh, and I guess, you know, when you're talking about a virus, they're not all the same. There are millions and zillions of them. They're different. And they were studying the character, my guess is they were studying the characteristics of this one virus, which may have come to them from a zoonotic, um, you know, origin, but they were looking at all the details. Now, could it be, Rupmati, that they know things about the characteristics of this virus, the mechanisms and behaviors of this virus that they have not yet shared? things that would help the world deal with this virus. And therefore, it's not just a question of accountability. It's a question of trying to get a better handle on the virus. Am I, is there anything in what I've said? Yes, the genome, the sequence was shared six days after, Jay. Six days, six days is a long time for the virus to start spreading. If the sequence was shared immediately, and when they shared the sequence, they said, this. Uh, virus does not uh, transmit. It does not uh, affect humans at all. It's just one uh, isolated case. So that six days allowing six weeks for uh, residents of Wuhan to travel outside of Wuhan. And as you know, uh, we have a large number of workers from Wuhan working in Italy. There's a factory which employs uh, uh, workers directly from uh, Wuhan. That's how we had the pandemic hit so hard in Italy first, yeah, yeah. through which it spread in Europe. So when you have these things being allowed, if they had this one case, if they had these hundred cases, they could have shut down Wuhan. But six weeks was a huge amount of time for the virus to allow to spread its wings rather. Yeah. And as we know, it's so interconnected. It just it just burst in, onto the global stage. You know, I remember back in the early days, uh, there was this thing about uh, tracing and tracking and trying to find people who would get on a telephone, <clears throat> trying to find software that would um, recognize, uh, you know, risky engagements that you might have in your life uh, as mm -hmm. to those who might be shedding virus. But that has uh, seemed to uh, uh, left the stage. Um, and although my, my understanding is uh, Hawaii still has a very mm, reduced uh, team of tracers, uh, fact is we're not tracing. Would you agree with me if I said this thing has gone way beyond tracing and there's very little we can do to trace these cases or is there something we can do? You're, you're absolutely right about this. Tracing is now outdated, isn't it? We can't go and find out these people from their homes. Or we, you know, um, there's a digital platform in, uh, in uh, what is that, um, in India, known as they have this uh, uh, IO that they, they, they track you on your mobile. They show you how many people around you are affected. Yes. And uh, I think that is, that is a far better option because mobile phones, mobile devices are with everyone. We have to develop these apps. There, a little bit of innovation is required to be able to track each and every person, though it may not be feasible. But we have to try and we have to innovate because the transmissibility, once it is restricted or rather uh, the mutations will cease to happen because this which is raging right now is the Delta virus, Delta, Delta variant. Yeah, well, there'll and, be more. Ah, right, so that's why when it uh, mutates, and we get another alpha, alpha is done, beta, and which one now? Gamma, isn't it? So now we are waiting for that to happen. Yeah, what's happening? So, hmm. Well, okay, uh, you know, it, it strikes me that, let me, let me say this, I, I believe, as with some of these other existential crises, for example, climate change, that COVID has changed the world order. It's not only that it has changed our individual lives and the lives of our community, it's changed the world order. We focus on different things. We spend time on it, 
which we could be spending on other things. The priorities in our lives and in our governments and in our engagements with other governments, uh, the priorities have been changed. There's very little, there's, <clears throat> there's very little news you hear on a given day that does not involve COVID. So my question to you is, um, is um, how profound is that change? Um, uh, I'll give you this, uh, I'll explain this to you through an example, Jay. See, India, India is such a huge population, uh, populated country, and we would have had to depend on the world for our vaccine production. But as soon as our lockdown started in March 2050, uh, 2020, uh, in April, uh, we moved to focusing on production of vaccines. Production of vaccines for this billion plus people was more possible uh, to cover our population. No, but no country would be ready to cover our population. Would it have been possible? No. They would have taken care of their domestic, their international exports, and then looked at us. This domestic production that started in India helped us to have self-sufficiency in vaccine production. And then once we have this self-sufficiency, we have uh, international obligations, which we have to take care of. So the priority of focusing on so many industries were asked to focus on oxygen production, on uh, vaccine production, remdesivir uh, um, uh, medicines were um, given uh, to other um, industries saying like, let's come together, biotechnology, uh, you have these business houses who come together, these charity organizations who are helping. Let's take these vaccine to the most underprivileged people. You have so many networks working just to provide COVID protection. This export, import of uh, manufacturing um, products, everything has changed. And like you say, the global world order has changed in such a way that you are thinking that how can I make my population safe first? And then let's think about the other things. So when you have um, this, this COVID crisis going on, everything has taken a backstage. Everything, you know, you have uh, solidarity in uh, production of vaccines. You have solidarity in uh, playing blame games too. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, we do. <laughs> So let's target somebody and let's now leave this one. It's 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 going on such a long time now. Uh, it's become a, part a, of the game. A <laughs> biblical test, I tell you. <laughs> well, we're we're out of time, Rupmati. I just want to thank you uh, from my heart uh, for this discussion as the last, and I hope we can circle back and do it again. And I hope things are better the next time we do it. Uh, now, on, on your book, can we flash a picture of your book one more time? And can you tell us how we can how we can get the book, uh, Raging Co COVID-19 Pandemic, The Wuhan Conspiracy? Question <laughs> mark. Yes. So how can how can how can we get that book? Now it's going to be on Amazon. It's just in printing, you know. It's just printing right now, and I'm so happy about it. Uh, so I'm going to look forward to this book and send you a copy ASAP. Okay, thank you, Ruth Mari Kandakar. I'm waiting for your movie. Of course, and I'll send you our movie. Take care, till the next time, aloha. Thank you, see you.